Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, Saturday, uh, June 13th. We're here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home to the most touchable warbirds in Texas. I've got Gary Goff with me again, and uh, we had a request to uh, do the RF-8 simulator again. We knew we had some connection problems when we did that originally. So uh, we're, we're here in the sim today, and then after we're finished uh, with the RF-8 simulator, we're going to show you the difference between 1959 and uh, 2020. So we are inside the back of the RF-8 uh, simulator trailer right now. Uh, this is a standard 18-wheel trailer. We'll show you that on the outside. But uh, we're starting to work from the back side, uh, the back side forward on this. Uh, the Navy built two of these, and it was to, uh, to train F-8 pilots. This one was built in 1959, and then it was converted to, uh, uh, converted to an RF-8 simulator. Hey, Mike. Uh, and it was converted to an RF-8 simulator sometime after that. We're really not sure. It's a little bit difficult to say. There were two of these built, one for the East Coast, one for the West Coast. And as you can see, it's all vacuum tubes back here. And uh, Gary and I were just noticing that we've got separate computer racks in here for angle of attack, dynamic pressure. Uh, what do we got down here? Heading, ball position, and each one of these is controlled by one of these racks in here, and the racks swing so that they could be, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the maintenance technician back here could uh, could take a look at these things and work on them. Now, Gary's gonna open up some of the drawers here because I, I think this is fascinating. This is the, uh, the, the, maintenance, uh, the maintenance area back here. So you had a technician, and uh, here we go. This thing is all done with vacuum this tubes. This is a vacuum tube, and these get very, very hot, very hot and different sizes, big ones and little ones. And these are the same kind that were used in TVs at that point yep. in that day. Uh, other drawers here, we've got resistors, capacitors, relays. Uh, I mean, this is just the way it came. So this is, not only does it smell like 1959 in here, it looks like 1959 in terms of all, all, of, the, uh, all of the things. We've got wiring harnesses uh, just specifically for this device and it would allow the cockpit to be able to uh, to be able to move. Here's some of the uh, the test bench uh, for the uh, uh, for the maintenance guy here in the back, and so we will start to move forward. Now I mentioned there were there were two of these built at a cost of eight hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars per device. Uh, you might notice this the floor comes up. Uh, there were uh, yeah, if we can get one. Uh, some of them, some of them will open, but there's nothing down there to see. There used to be big motors down there, because the the simulator itself would move. Now these were air conditioned, very seriously air conditioned. Yeah, because this would get uh, very very hot back here, and uh, you'll notice that the door, uh, the door is a soundproof door, so, so that make noise. yeah, too. so that the person who's back in here and while these things are moving in gears, you're going to see that some of this stuff is all gear driven for pitch angle and things like that. And to think about all these huge, all of this, just to drive one small little function of an instrument. And this entire bay that we've seen is all can be reduced now into a single microchip, which yeah. is crazy. And as, as Mike is saying, this is absolutely a 1959 time capsule. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, we're gonna show you how much more here in a second too. Oh my but gosh. Now as we move out, of the, uh, out of, we move out of the maintenance area, this is the instructor's console right here. And uh, the center console is the flight panel. So all of the gauges and things that you would see on this panel are what the pilot is going to see up in the cockpit, up in front. So the instructor can see exactly what the student is going to see. The instructor, however, has nice little things like mm. Mm, wing position light failure, yes. uh, wing raise failure, normal aileron trim controls. So he can. Uh, uh, he can do all kinds of things back here to make life difficult for people, or as we used to say in the uh, uh, in the airline business, going in and doing these flights and these things, we call that you bet your job. So, uh, yeah, it's a dial of disaster right here. <clears throat> Man, I can tell you, is being on both sides, one being the pilot and one being the instructor, you have to kind of be a little, you know, uh, evil. Yeah, <laughs> those some of the things you can do to poor pilot. Yeah, you do. I, I can tell you that I had an experience uh, with the RF-4. We didn't have simulators for the RF-4 in the Marine Corps, so I had to go to uh, to <laughs> South Carolina. This is awesome. Uh, and 
uh, and fly the Air Force's simulator. And of course, we had to know the systems and that kind of stuff. And every once in a while, you'd run into an instructor who wanted to give you a failure that was impossible in the airplane. Right. And uh, I remember going nose to nose with an Air Force major one day about uh, about just that uh, that issue. So uh, you can see here gauges on the fuel and the engine gauges. And so everything that the pilot's going to see inside, uh, they're going to see back there. We do have one other thing that makes this a, an interesting time capsule. I don't know if we've got anything oh, yeah. on there. But, no, we don't. We've got, we've got, uh, we've got, uh, in this one we've got bolts, but uh, we do have historic cigarette butts in one of the other, uh, one of the others. Now, here's part of the, uh, the system that's really pretty interesting. This is a moving map display, and these were used for a long, long time. Uh, I don't know, Gary, did you ever use any of these in the military? Uh, no, we never. Uh, I was never an instructor, simulator instructor in the military, but in the uh, airlines, they had a moving map display, but it was three-dimensional, and somebody had built a model city, landscape, farmlands, and everything else that you would fly over for flying visual. So you can see here that this is over... Uh, Elizabeth City, this is New Jersey, uh, Norfolk. Uh, this is actually uh, when these airplanes were being used out of, uh, uh, out of Andrews Air Force Base. The RF-4s, or RF-8s rather, were one of the last of the F-8s to fly. And then one of the things that we found, and we told you when we, uh, when we did the airplane itself a little bit earlier, is that uh, when we came in, the airplane came to us first, and then several years later, uh, we got this, uh, got this trailer. And one of the things, Gary, if you'd open up the doors on the, I think it's the right-hand side, either way. Yeah, and pull out one of those drawers. Uh, pull out the drawer on the left. Oh, uh, Lord. No, I'm messing with one of those. They're all empty. Uh-oh. Somebody, somebody, somebody took them out. But what we found in here, and I'm sure we still got them, yeah. is uh, we found... Security. Uh, yeah, we found, uh, we found the pilot... Uh, pilot folders oh, yeah. and, and their experience here in the simulator which turned out to be exactly from the other uh, from the squadron that the airplane was from so now we're going to go up here to the business end here if you want to move this forward is, this is the what we call the torture chamber this is where i'm going to get tortured and uh, this is uh this is an rf8 simulator it's a, it's an actual rf8 simulator and uh what was really special about these things in the 50s is they they drove these around from base to base uh, they also did it with B-52s in the Air Force, except they used two railroad cars for the B-52 B uh, simulators. But this is an actual cockpit, and they actually had sound and motion in here. If we look back here up above, you're going to see that we've got a blue light and a white light, and we've got a, uh, uh, a speaker. And then underneath here, we have, uh, we have a red light, so they could simulate a lot of different things back here. But the pilots would go in, and most of the time it was an emergency simulator. Although with the RF-8, they could also uh, they could also uh, work on using the using all of the cameras. And uh, I'm going to show some right behind you, Gary. There you go. There are some. Oh, look at that! 1950s cigarette butts. And there's our historic cigarette Yay. butts. So those are artifacts that we will leave here. But it's that, they're insured too, so we yeah. can make sure if we lose them, we can get them replaced. But it's interesting to think that the uh, that the instructor would sit out here on the seat and could do a, could do a, a cockpit check with him, or sit outside here with a headset on, and he'd be sitting here smoking while the pilot's inside. And actually, in an F8, there's also there's also an ashtray in the F8. So, uh, like the old seven two days. Yeah. So to give you a look back through the simulator, this is a this is a normal size 18 wheeler trailer, and I can tell you when you close up these soundproof doors, it gets real quiet in here. So that's what it looks like in the back. And we brought you up through the front, and you've gotten to see that part of it. And so you have to remember that the RF8 is what uh, astronaut John Glenn, but at the time he was not an astronaut, astronaut John Glenn was able to set the speed record from coast to coast at 3 hours and 21 minutes. So that's pretty fast because the RF-8 was so slick that uh, it was just, man, a rocket. And so he set, he set the coast to coast record. Well, and this was also the type of airplane that uh, found the missiles in Cuba. And uh, at that point in time, it was, uh, it was all film. So the airplanes would go out in a two ship and then they would go in and fly over Cuba at a thousand feet or less. And uh, they would go ahead and, and take pictures. The whole idea is they went out as a two ship, 
because there's an old Marine Corps saying, if you've got one, you've got none. If you've got two, you've got one. So in the event that one <laughs> of the airplanes would get shot down, hopefully one would bring back, uh, would bring back the goods. Uh, but that big uh, round device here in the middle is called the periscope. And uh, it actually looks down through the front so the pilot could actually look through there and it magnifies so you could look for your targets there. In many cases, because I flew our Air Force, you just have a set of coordinates. You'd go to that coordinate and you'd turn all, everything on and then just kind of go from there. You used to adjust things here too. This is what, so you just notice that the stick here is not your typical stick because it's, it, it's got some of the switches like triggers and everything else, but it's also got stuff to be able to move the cameras move everything and it's I, I look at this and I just am amazed at how busy this poor soul was in this aircraft while it's screaming 100 feet above ground trying to take pictures these guys man were they busy and it was the first airplane that the uh, that the Navy built that was supersonic it would do 1.2 times the speed of sound so now we're gonna walk you out and even though uh, this is not an official military simulator that we're going to next we're going to go over here to uh, uh, to uh, what we kind of uh, jokingly refer to as, as Cousin Eddie's, if any of you get that, Cousin Eddie's uh, VR experience. And uh, we have taken this, uh, this RV and we have set it up with uh, four simulator stations. And we're going to go in and show you that. There, we have four uh, Sony VR uh, simulator stations in the... Uh, in the Instead sim. of one big tractor trailer with one cockpit, guess what we have? We have we have we something have, cool. We have one RV. Air Hi, Paul. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. There's somebody doing it right there. Yeah, we're gonna turn around and let Paul have the mic and close that because it's pretty bright out there. there you go, Paul. This is uh, this is Paul Angle. Paul has been the person who's helped uh, develop the sim here. Uh, so that we can do a sim experience. We've had it on the road a few times, uh, but uh, but only a few times um, because of the way situations are right now. Yeah, but I painted to... it. Yeah, well, Gary. Yeah, I painted. Well, my wife painted it. Gary painted it a lot. But what we what we've got here in this area is uh, is essentially a briefing room. It's a little bit hard to show you here uh, in this uh, small confined area. But we do briefings here, and uh, Paul's going to show us what we've got here in the back. All right. Well, I've got a couple of guys in here, so you know. Just to give you an idea of what you can, you can do in here, we set it up with uh, with seats. Um, as you can see, he's fixing to take off. Uh, Joseph uh, using a PlayStation 4, uh, using a VR simulator. You can see his VR helmet, and when he looks around, you can see just like if he was sitting in a cockpit of a plane, looking around. Uh, as he goes, you know, he's got his, his controls. Uh, they do all the same thing with the controls, all those buttons and switches and knobs and everything in the RFA simulator, they can do it all with the, all the little controls and buttons that are on these uh, joysticks. And it's pretty much the same in the newer planes. They don't have near as many buttons and switches and knobs in the newer planes as they do in the old ones. Um, they're all touch screen, they're all, uh, everything's at, at, at your fingers touch. Um, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, reaching down to, to flip a switch where you can just reach up and touch it with your finger. You can see Joseph's on the roll right now in the, uh, and just lifting off over the top of a, a B-52 crash. And basically you're looking at what he's seeing uh, straight out the front of his VR goggles. So if you, you can see that he's looking up and what, that's what he's looking at. If he looks down back at his gauges, you can see inside the cockpit uh, and then you know, as he looks around, it's just like he's sitting in the cockpit of a plane, flying. Uh, he can look back and see the wings. Can you look back for us? There you go. The wings, just like in a real plane. So you can see if people are coming behind him or from on top. Uh, it really is uh, pretty good. <laughs> uh, now, Michael Lafferty asked on the other one, the range of motion, Mike, in the RF-8 simulator wasn't much. But you don't need more than a couple of degrees, two or three degrees, to be able to feel the full motion of either cat shots or rolling or anything. It starts to make your inner ear move. Here we get the same thing, except you're doing it yourself with VR. Uh, consider that in 1959, that uh, RF-8 simulator cost $850,000, and it was a huge savings for the Navy because it cost, in 1959, it cost $125 an hour to fly an F-8. Believe that one or not. 
Uh, I'd go fly it all day for that. Uh, but the uh, simulator itself only cost like $1.50 an hour. So it was a huge, huge savings. And here we're talking about these kind of visuals are what pilots are seeing today, even more sophisticated in the simulators today. But this is what's generally available. And, and Paul, what's a system like this cost? Uh, well, we bought it about a year and a half ago. It was about $1,000 for everything. Uh, you can find it used on the cheaper, but then, you know, you're going to pay right around $1,000 for the whole setup. Uh, and, and as Jim was saying, this is the, what the pilots are saying. They're actually, the, the new pilots in the military are actually using the same engine that this game uses to train with. The Unreal Engine is the one that they're they're actually using to, to set up the same sim. It, you know, their simulators are a little bit nicer, uh, but they uh, they're using the same software. Uh, this software is that sophisticated. Well, and they're not only using it for airplanes now, they've got simulators for, for tanks and all the different vehicles and boats and submarines and, and everything. But the cost of doing this is, is so much more cost effective now. Uh, in fact, when I flew the, uh, the 777 with Continental Airlines, I never flew in the actual airplane until the first flight that I had in it, which was a revenue flight, which meant I had a crew, I had passengers, and uh, we took off out of Houston and went to London, and that was the first time I was ever, I ever flew in the actual airplane other than a walkthrough. So it was all in simulators. Uh, here we're not uh, we're not putting people through failed engines and things like that so much. This is uh, this is a lot more for fun, and you can see here on the other side that uh, we've got a full full four uh, four simulator uh, arrangements here. But due to uh, due to our social distancing, we're not trying to do more than. We're not trying to do more than two right now. We could probably probably do three if we wanted to, but two would be the be the best of it. Uh, we are still looking at uh, having the outside of this uh, painted or coated so that uh, it will look uh, it'll look a little bit more like a like an actual simulator on the outside rather than uh, Cousin Eddie's uh, uh, RV. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit of a work in progress. Yeah, but we've proved the concept. Uh, this took us nearly four years to get uh, to get done and to where it uh, was effective and works. It does work. We've had it at some air shows, uh, and we've had it up and running for uh, for things like uh, hops or hops and props and, and that kind jamboree. of stuff. So yeah, Boy Scout Jamboree took it out for Boy Scout Jamboree and let them go. Uh, we've got Susan for uh, from from Neha, Wisconsin again. Hi, Susan. Uh, so we're glad to have uh, have you folks join us today. And we know that some of you wanted to see the RF-8 simulator again, and so we thought it would be fun for you to see uh, what's going on in here. So when Joseph turns around and looks at us, he can't actually see us. He doesn't know we're making faces at him. So, <laughs> so uh, we're getting close to our uh, to our, our 20 minutes time here. Does anybody have any questions on any of this? Yeah, I have a question. Can you get airsick while playing this game? Yes. Yes, you can, because I almost threw up flying the game, and I'm a fighter pilot. So, yeah, it's pretty real. Here's, here's Gary the Eagle driver. And, <laughs> and so uh, so because of Gary's experience, uh, we've made sure that we have uh, barf bags and buckets in here for each one of the seats. <laughs> so, well, Joseph just flew through the trees. But Way he to go, gets, Joseph. But he gets a chance to go out again. Now, Joseph's flying the F-16 here, but we've... No, uh, flying an uh, SU. Oh, the, okay. He's he's flying the Su-27. There's there's others. There's F-16s. There's F-18s. Uh, we've got a variety of airplanes they can fly, don't we, Paul? Uh, right now we have the Russian Su-27 and the and the uh, F-15 or uh, sorry F-18. Uh, we need some people to come out and actually fly these and, and beat the mission, so we can add the other planes so other people can fly those planes. So if anybody wants to come out on a Saturday when we're here and just fly and, and beat the mission, come on out. Okay, well, Paul, I want to thank you for being with us here today and, and helping uh, helping us show all of this stuff to folks. And if you've got any other questions, this is going to be uh, up uh, up on Facebook, and then we'll uh, transfer it over to YouTube. But in the meantime, from uh, from Gary and Paul and Joseph and William, we'd like to uh, thank you for joining us here with Fun with Aviation today uh, at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home to the most touchable warbirds in Texas. Thanks. Have a good weekend, folks. Stay safe. See ya.